Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining the session. Heidi, thank you for the, uh, for the introduction. Um, so my name is Alan Getz, and I work for Gilbarco Vita Roots e-mobility team. Uh, very excited to have the chance to, to be on the line today, and, and thanks to the folks at Pathmaster for, for setting this session up. So today we're going to spend some time talking about um, e-mobility and the exciting world of electric vehicle charging. And so um, thanks again for everybody for, for jumping on the session today. So maybe the first place to get started, a little bit about Gilbarco Vita Root and kind of who we are as a, as a global organization. So we're, we're owned by a Fortune 500 company called Volunteer, and we've got uh, uh, direct lines to businesses that reach into the traffic space, which I think you guys may know through Pathmaster, through GTT. Uh, we also have companies that focus on uh, telematics and vehicle tracking, uh, franchise tools, and also some instrumentation and diagnostics. But uh, very much a global organization, 8,300 team members, locations uh, all around the world. If you don't know Gilbarco Vita Root directly by name, you absolutely know us by product. Chances are you've been touching one of our products uh, about once a week since you turned 16. So if you're looking at this slide, you'll see all the way on the left-hand side, probably a very familiar site for you, which is uh, one of our Encore 700 fuel dispensers. In the United States market, we've built six out of 10 gas pumps used at gas stations, eight out of 10 dispensers used in the truck stop industry. So we have a, a very heavy presence in the convenience store market. Uh, in the middle of this slide, you'll see one of our, our products that comes from a commercial industrial fuel dispenser line that's focused on um, behind the fence fleet fuel. So if some of the folks that are on the line today come from um, uh, municipal backgrounds, if your organization has your own private fuel tank, uh, it's very likely that you are using some of our technology today to monitor that inventory, to manage how it gets dispensed, um, also to make sure that you are compliant with state regulations for having uh, fuel underground or above ground. So for a company like ours, it, it makes a lot of sense to stretch from uh, installations that probably look like the one on the left-hand side of the screen here, you know, a big diesel tank with a gas dispenser and a fuel control system, something that you'd find deployed at a trucking company, a government fueling depot, um, maybe at a port or at a, uh, a transit authority. It, it makes a lot of sense for us to transition into the fuel of the future as a total e-mobility solutions provider. And that's where it makes a ton of sense, again, for us to be partnering with companies like Pathmaster, your local distributor, to help bring these solutions to the market. So you might think a company like Gilbarco Vita Root with such a strong history, 155 years of being in traditional petroleum equipment, we might, you might think we would look at alternative fuels and say, you know, oh, no, that's a, that's a dirty word. Uh, it's simply not true, though. As you guys know, uh, alternative fuels have been on the market for well over two decades. We've been engineering our fuel dispensers to be capable of dispensing some of these very caustic fuels like E85 uh, for well over 15 years. We also even own a CNG compressor company called Angie. So for, for us, uh, alternative fuels have really been part of the mix for a long time, and we've continued that trend uh, through investments in hardware, software, continuing our great reputation for service and certainly service after the sale. So we're going to talk a little bit today about why organizations are taking a look at uh, making the move to EV through a couple different use cases. Um, and, and first off, I guess it's important to do a bit of a level set and talk about um, clean energy and, and what it means to be thinking about making these transitions to e-mobility. So uh, I pulled up some, uh, some stats that came from a website that talks about how, um, how efficient a, uh, an internal combustion engine would have to be in order for it to be as clean as an EV is. So even though we may be getting power from the grid that's not coming from a renewable source, it could be a coal-fired power plant, the economies of scale that we get from producing power at a central location rather than accomplishing it at the individual engine level is such that you'd actually have to be getting 63 miles to a gallon right now in Northeast Ohio to be as clean with a gasoline engine as an EV is. So this is, a, this is huge when we think about uh, what the impact is on our, our global environment. Now, a lot of times when I talk to people, they have uh, interest in going green without necessarily running in red. 
And so this next slide speaks to uh, that e-gallon cost. Everybody knows that EVs are more expensive today than a traditional internal combustion engine. But they pencil out in the long run, particularly for fleet applications, when we start to think about what you don't have to do for an EV. You don't have to change the plugs. You don't have to change the fuel filters. It doesn't have to come in for an oil change. Also, you don't have to pay for gasoline the way that we would typically expect. So these figures are from back in March, but they tell a pretty compelling story. When we're talking about more than, than half or rather less than half the cost of fuel for an e-gallon equivalent in comparison to a traditional gallon uh, of gasoline. So a little bit of information to kind of help uh, build the case as to why an EV makes sense if you guys have any, uh, any stretch into the fleet side of operations. What we're gonna do next is talk a little bit about uh, types of charging that are available. So uh, first off, we should, we should understand that there's level one, level two, and level three charging. Uh, level three is also typically called DC fast charge. So level one charging is consumer charging. Uh, if you bought an EV today and you brought it home and you said, oh no, how do I charge this thing? Uh, you'd probably reach into the trunk of the vehicle and you would grab uh, a, a basically a fancy extension cord that's going to plug into a standard 120 wall outlet and then plug into the vehicle. And it's going to dispense power at the rate of um, maybe three miles an hour back to your vehicle. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, and it's not, but for most consumers, uh, they only drive 30 miles a day. And if that vehicle is going to park from 7 o'clock at night to 7 o'clock in the morning, that's 12 hours of charging, 3 miles an hour. We just covered 36 miles of range. This is essentially a gas station that just got stood up in your garage. And probably unlike any other time in your life, with this type of charger, every time you leave the house in the morning, you're leaving with a full tank. Now that's a pretty interesting thing to think about. You've never had a gas station in your garage before. You've never been able to leave the full tank every day of the week and go the full range of that vehicle without having to stop at the gas station. Level one charging works out really well for those consumers who drive 30 miles or less in a day. But if a vehicle drives more than that, they're probably going to look for uh, more oomph, more juice from their charging session. And that's where a level two charging station comes in. If you've seen chargers out and around town, um, at the mall, at the movie theater, maybe at the bank, or coming soon to Pathmaster's headquarters, these are going to be level two charging stations. Uh, they're going to run on uh, the same voltage as a dryer if you've got an electric dryer at your house, or 208 volt commercial power. And with these units, you're looking at an average of maybe um, 20 to 25 miles of range on a 7.2 kilowatt level two charger. So, this is a much better fit for someone who uh, was a little low on battery, but needed to go downtown and, and get some lunch. Um, someone who is parking in a public parking garage. So with, with level two charging, we start to solve for some use cases for public access charging. For example, if a municipality wanted to stand up their own charging program, make it available for uh, citizens and visitors to, to use. <laughs> also starts to solve for fleet style charging where the municipality's vehicles may drive closer to 70, 80, maybe even 100 miles in a day. Level two charging makes a lot of sense for that. Finally, at the, the apex, the top of the pyramid is DC fast charging. So it, inherently it's fast, much faster than level two charging. With DC fast charging, you're talking about taking a vehicle from a battery percentage down in the teens to a battery near 80% over the course of maybe 20 to 30 minutes. And so that makes a lot of sense if we're thinking about a municipal public charging program that's located near the interstate. From a Gilbarco Beta Route perspective, it makes a lot of sense to put this in at uh, convenience stores or other locations where consumers come for a short period of time but would need a really powerful charge. Um, these chargers require a whole lot more power from the grid in order to work. So that's important to note as well. And then finally, from a, a fleet perspective, DC fast charge is, is basically table stakes if we're thinking about some of the largest EVs that are on the market today, like uh, a Metro Transit Authority style transit bus or uh, a Mac electric refuse truck or a Volvo VNR 18 wheeler. So. And with the bigger the vehicle, the bigger the battery pack, the bigger the battery pack, the bigger the charger. And so that's where DC fast chargers make a lot of sense for fleet. 
The next thing that we need to talk about, pretty common questions, has to do with the, the connectors, so the, the plugs, if you will. So in the United States, uh, essentially all level two charging is accomplished on a type one J1772 connector. This is industry standard. This is what all American OEMs are using. This is what uh, European OEMs are using as well. So a type one connector, again, call, also called the J1772. The other popular style of connector is uh, a Chaimo connector. That's for uh, Japanese style vehicles. So if you've got a Nissan, great, it, it has a Chaimo connector for the DC fast charge side of things. Uh, finally is a CCS1. If we look at the CCS1 that I pulled up on the screen, it's just like a type one, but it actually has two prongs at the bottom that handle the DC side of, uh, of, of the charger. So a lot of questions that I get are, you know, will uh, a level two charger coming from Pathmaster, will it charge a Tesla? And the answer is yes, it'll do it with a little adapter. Most Tesla drivers want to be able to charge outside of just that limited Tesla network. And so uh, they buy these inexpensive adapters. These adapters come from, you know, Amazon. Um, and that goes from my type one connector to the adapter to the Tesla to charge that vehicle successfully. So, uh, you know, from, a, from an OEM standpoint, we work with everyone ranging from the sedans all the way up to, you know, class eight, 18 wheelers. And there's a lot of exciting things coming down the pipe, even in the future, thinking about electric watercraft, electric aircraft, um, the whole world may be moving in this direction to, to help with uh, these challenges that we're facing from an environmental standpoint. So uh, the important thing to take away here is um, if your organization is thinking about standing up a public access charging program to allow uh, citizens and visitors to charge, or you're thinking about uh, installing chargers for fleet use or for employees to charge, uh, we've got the kind of plugs and connectors that make this make sense. So with that, we're going to transition a little bit away from uh, the, the use case for EV and why it makes sense and a little bit about uh, the types of chargers and the types of connectors to talking about software. So there, there's really two kinds of software solutions that we should be thinking about. And one of them is going to be for that public access use case. So a very common question in my world is, can I make money with a charging program? And the answer is, Absolutely. Are you going to make uh, mountains of money? No, but are you going to be able to run it in the black? Yes, you will. So when, when we think about charging stations that are going in, say, at a coffee shop, they're looking to generate revenue. They're looking to uh, entice consumers to come to that location. If we're uh, talking about a municipality, a public access program in a parking garage is going to make your city um, come across as a much greener location. And it, it'll help you meet mandates that may be coming from city council or uh, you know, perhaps one day soon from the governor or perhaps even the federal government. So the, these charging programs are going to allow you to operate chargers. Can you make them free? Absolutely, you sure can. Could you change your mind in six weeks and, and make them cost a fee for the end user? Sure, absolutely. So you've got capability to uh, generate revenue, you can set your own price, you have options to set up programs for um, special membership programs or guest visitor programs. From a driver standpoint, the driver is going to be uh, using their own personal cell phone with an app with their personal credit card loaded on it. That's how they find the charger, that's how they pay for a charging session. And then circling to the back office side, this is where you're going to be able to Pull reports that show you how much uh, how much your savings have been generated in CO2. Show how much energy has been dispensed. Show how much revenue has been generated. So from a, a public access standpoint, it makes a lot of sense to have these chargers in place. And you're going to have access to you know, dashboard style views that show you this simple to use reporting. So this is really important as we think about uh, an EV charging program that may be going into, um, again, a parking garage or maybe downtown at the Civic Center or the City Hall, uh, any kind of public access style program, we've certainly got the capability to cover that. On the flip side, we might think about uh, EV charging for fleet, where the use case is a little bit different. So this gets more into making sure the vehicles are fully charged, uh, being able to schedule charging sessions, 
being able to limit who has access to these chargers. So th this is a big deal when we start thinking about fleet charging. We're not necessarily using a phone to find a, a charger or to unlock a charger. Instead, it'll be more like a fueling operation that you're used to for traditional fuel in a, say, a municipal fueling style arrangement where uh, you pull up to a location, you use a key fob to unlock a charger, you plug in, the vehicle sits overnight. At the end of the day, we track all of that energy that's been dispensed. And we can track it back to the vehicle level and, again, pull these reports that show utilization and carbon savings and so on. So, again, dashboards, being able to see that CO2 reduction, this is really important. Also helping you be able to make sure that you, you've got the kind of uptime that you need for your charging sessions. So, if we think back to some of those basic questions. Number one, can I charge a wide variety of vehicles using the Gilbarco Leader Group and Pathmaster program? Absolutely. Number two, am I going to be able to make money with these chargers? Sure, if you want to. What if I want to use them for fleet use? Absolutely, we've got the software to solve for that. So next up, let's talk a little bit about hardware and some of those use cases. So we're going to talk about our, our level two charging programs. And, and like I mentioned at the beginning, Level one, a little bit more for a consumer in their own garage. Level two, public access and fleet style charging. So how does it work? Well, if I drive an, an EV, I'm going to use my phone to find a charger. It's going to be located downtown at the courthouse. Okay, great. My app is helping me find that charger and navigate to it. When I pull up to the unit, I'm going to be able to use my phone again to unlock that charger. It's linked to my personal credit card. Now, as a site host, as the person who runs the EV charging program, you've set up a pricing policy if you want to try and make money with your charging. And I'm agreeing to that as an end user who's going to use that, that station. So I've authorized the charger, I plug in and I leave and I go have a great lunch and do some shopping. And two hours later, I come back. When I disconnect, uh, there's going to be a, a credit card transaction that, that is occurring. And uh, this is how you're going to make revenue using those charging stations. So a very similar style session uh, would be a workplace charging program. So if we think about, um, let's say, for example, Pathmaster's headquarters. So that building, uh, Randy owns the building, and he decides he wants to make EV charging available for his employees. OK, great. Um, we've got some choices there. Do we want that station to be visible for the public to use as well, or is it just for employees? Do we want to run a special discount program for our employees who work there? Uh, in a municipal setting, this could be let's say the garage next to the library uh, is going to have the ability to, to have charging for people who uh, come to visit the library, but maybe it's uh, 25 cents off for people who use uh, the chargers who work at the library or work for the city. Again, we're using a cell phone as the primary methodology of authorization. Again, it's linked to a personal credit card. And so, sure, we can stand up an EV charging program for employees. The, the final use case is going to bring us into that fleet style charging scenario. And in this instance, maybe we don't want a charger that uh, is going to bring people in. Uh, this is going to go behind the fence at the public works yard where the vehicles sit overnight. In, in that case, we don't want strangers coming in. Um, maybe there's no reason for employees to charge their personal vehicles behind the fence of this operation. Okay, great. So instead of using the phone, we're using a key fob. We are authorizing that charger, plugging in, sitting overnight to get, uh, get energy. And uh, when we leave, we capture how many dollars worth of energy went into that vehicle and what vehicle it went into. So very simple uh, style reporting. Again, web-based, very easy to use. So those are the, the three use cases that we solve for with level two charging. Next up, a little bit about the actual hardware itself. So through Pathmaster, we sell a variety of different types of equipment. Uh, we make chargers that are designed for uh, mounting directly on the wall of a building or to be mounted uh, on a pedestal in front of a parking stop. So we come in a bunch of different flavors. We make them in singles, we make them in doubles. These are weather rated units. They're meant to be installed outside in the sun, in the rain, in the snow, in the ice. So they, they do not require a canopy. And uh, the, the majority of the unit itself is actually made out of aluminum. So it's, it's rough and tumble. Uh, 
Um, again, these units come standard with that J1772 connector. Again, very capable of charging you know, Teslas and other EVs that are on the market today. So the, the Series 6 unit is geared for public access and for that employee workplace charging program. My Series F7 is a lower cost unit that's designed for fleet use only. So same style construction, again, weather rated, you know, the majority of the body of the unit is aluminum itself. Um, definitely available in configurations, again, wall mount, pedestal mount, so on. But again, designed for fleet use only. And then the final unit in my, my Amps to Go series for level two charging is an F19. Uh, this is a unit we released less than a month ago, and it is designed for the high level two charging spectrum. So uh, a standard level two charger distributes up to 7.2 kilowatts of energy uh, over the course of an hour. This is delivering 19.2 kilowatts, so almost three times as much power. Now, when I talked to the guys at Pathmaster about this, they were very exciting, excited about it because um, it only comes at a very modest price premium for you to be able to get three times as much power for your fleet charging program. Uh, this is a great way to future-proof what you need for tomorrow. Um, when we think about things like the new F-150 Lite, it's going to be a huge hit for the fleet market. So this is a great way to charge those vehicles uh, successfully. Okay, probably the next questions you guys are going to ask about are going to be about warrant. So uh, number one, these units come with a full replacement warranty. Uh, that is industry best in class. Uh, some of our competitors, their, their standard warranty is only parts and labor, and they upcharge for a full replacement. We come in at full replacement. So that's a sign of the quality and the commitment of, that we're making with our partners, Pathmaster, to you guys, our end users in this process. These units are easy to own, they're easy to operate. It's got simple software for you to use. Uh, these units are equipped with their own individual cellular modems. That's important. That's how they connect to our cloud-based software. And that gives you maximum uptime and reliability for the unit itself. It also means you're not required to put anything on your organization's infrastructure. So if you're a municipality or a public agency, uh, you do not have to involve your IT department in order to accomplish the charging. Okay, we've covered a lot there. Heidi, quick pause. Let's see, were there any questions in the chat so far? I'm looking, Alan, it doesn't look like we have any questions yet. So feel okay. free, anybody, if you have questions, go ahead and place them in the chat. We will circle back and make sure we address all of those, but nothing so far. Okay, cool, very good. Well, so we, we've covered a little bit about Marco Viterud and our approach with Pathmaster. We've talked a little bit about the, the reasons why people are electrifying from a consumer standpoint and also from a fleet standpoint. Um, we've talked a little bit about you know, software and how we're able to handle different types of uh, use cases for public access charge, employee workplace charge, or uh, fleet style charge. We've, we've talked about the connectors and how those connectors uh, can impact um, different vehicle types and making sure that everybody is able to access one of these chargers. And we also briefly touched on DC fast charging. Uh, this is going to be kind of the, the, the tail end of things as we think about the future of EVs and some of these larger vehicles that are coming to market. So DC fast chargers, um, well, obviously they're fast. This is important. Again, as we think about um, a Class 8 18 wheeler or an electric refuse truck or an electric transit vehicle or a box truck, um, the bigger the vehicle, again, the bigger the battery pack. The bigger the battery pack, the bigger the charger. And so we've got a variety of different DC fast chargers that are sized and scaled to make sure that we can fit the use case for the vehicle. So again, you know, we're looking at uh, very short duration charging times on chargers ranging from 50 kilowatts all the way up to 175 kilowatts. Um, these chargers are going to require significantly more power than a level two charger. Uh, chances are a level two charger for you, you may even have the space in the panel at your facility today to install these types of chargers. They're very inexpensive to install. Again, it's 208 volt commercial power. Building already has that. Uh, something like 30 amps per connecting point. You, again, you may already have that in the panel. It's just a matter of running some conduit. 
mounting the unit and starting up the software. On the, the DC fast charge side of things, again, a little bit more investment required because the likelihood that your building has the kind of power and amperage today, probably not as likely. So these are going to require 480 volt three phase power. And lots of times that's going to involve communication with your local utility to bring that kind of power and transformers to your facility so that you can run uh, a DC fast charger. So uh, we make DC fast chargers again in a variety of different flavors that can fit what that use case is. And important thing to note here, we can scale these programs. So if you're with an organization who's thinking about how to get started with an EV charging program, most organizations start by um, putting in a couple of public access chargers. They start by thinking about taking delivery of a few fleet vehicles, Nissan Leaf, Chevy Bolt. They're going to replace uh, a codes enforcement vehicle. They're going to replace a parking enforcement vehicle. Hanging fruit, if you will. Um, they may replace here in the next couple of years a handful of F-150s with battery electric, uh, lightning F-150s. Those kinds of programs are very easy to start with with a Pathmaster of Gilbarco v level two charging station. Again, low cost to purchase, low cost to operate, very simple. As we think about growing, we think about adding charging stations at more public facilities, and we think about adding charging stations um, at, at more fleet locations where vehicles domicile overnight. We start to think about taking delivery of some of these bigger vehicles, and that's where our approach with Pathmaster allows you to grow and scale. So it's not just level two charging, but it also includes a variety of different level two chargers. Again, you remember 7.2 kilowatts, 19.2 kilowatts, 50, 75, 175. It's kind of a, a, a very wide array, excuse me, array of charging options to really fit that need as you continue to grow. So DC fast charging is a great fit for the bigger vehicles and also for places where charging needs to occur quickly today. All right. Enough on DC fast charge, maybe a little bit about our programs and how we go, go to market. So with Pathmaster, with our distribution base, we've got over 2,300 certified technicians deployed in the field across the United States and Canada today. So we have an existing network of people who today keep the nation's critical fueling infrastructure up and running. We build gas stations with our authorized service contracts. We keep them serviced. We make sure that uh, all the pumping positions stay up and running. And we do the same thing for municipal fleet organizations today. So this is really important. We are not trying to build an install network or a service network. We already have an install network and a service network. That's really important. If necessary, we can do a full turnkey install. If we're thinking about a, a, a level two charging station, an important distinction here is we're not going to require the use of a special contract. Level two charging is fairly simple. If you're a municipal organization and you've already got electricians on staff or you have a contract with a local electrician, right, you can use them. And we're not going to charge extra fees for you to use your own contractor. All we require for level two charging is uh, that they be licensed electrical contractor. So um, you can use your own, you know, bring your own contractor or uh, we're certainly capable of, of using our contractors as well, our service network to accomplish um, maybe what's a, perhaps a, a bigger project that you don't necessarily want to tackle on your own. Great, we can bring in our experts to do a turnkey and switch. So there are a lot of different options available on that front. From a procurement standpoint, I think this is really important to note as well. Um, lots of times when I work with, um, with public agencies, nonprofits, not for profits, um, they're looking for a contract that they can buy off of. And we're, we've actually been awarded a couple of different national cooperative contracts. Uh, one of them is with an organization called NCPA, another is with an organization called Byboard. These are free contracts for nonprofits to use to be able to make a procurement. They also should help you avoid having to go out to an RFP for EV chargers. That's a huge deal. Um, in my 15 years of working in the government fleet space, nobody wants to write RFPs, and not, we certainly don't like to have to respond to either. So being able to buy off a cooperative purchasing contract is a big deal. 
And we've got these available through Pathmaster. So I think that's a really important note. Guys, this is the end of the presentation. I wanted to make sure that we baked in plenty of time for Q&A and I can sort of kind of bounce around as is necessary. I know we've got Brad and Kevin and a couple other folks on the line. Um, what kind of questions do you guys have? Please feel free to put them in the chat or uh, since we've got a little bit of time left, if we, if we want to come off mute, we can, we can work that way as well. All right, guys. Heidi, quick check. Anything in the chat? Uh, just looking right now, Alan. It doesn't look like we have anything, but as Alan said, you can unmute yourself and ask away. Or you can put them. Oh, we just had one pop in. Um, okay. Are there any government assistance in purchasing at this time? Yeah, great question. So um, if you take a, a spin out, and we'll do it right now since we have a little bit of time left. Uh, if we take a look out at the Roberto Vida Root website, and we take a peek at uh, the, the products section. And we go down here to that. Just a second. EV charging incentives, here we go. This will give you an opportunity to pick your state. So if you're located in Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Pennsylvania, wherever you may be, um, our website contains this, uh, this option for you to go check out what may be available, either coming from uh, your local Clean Cities group, it could be coming from Volkswagen and Dieselgate dollars, uh, could be coming from your local utility. This is a great chance for utilities to help influence the future. They want you to buy more electrons, so they may be willing to put some dollars on the table to help defray some of these costs. Um, I've actually had a couple of projects that have been successfully running in Ohio using these types of dollars. The big thing to note about the, the, the grant monies that may be available is, um, number one, lots of them are time sensitive and they may have uh, a limited amount of dollars in each funding round that they release. So um, it's very important that you uh, apply quickly if you're interested in a grant. Uh, because once the dollars are gone, you may have to wait six months before the next round of grant funding becomes available. So that's important. Um, number two, if you're looking at, at applying for a grant, uh, Heidi and team and myself will be more than happy to help you better understand costs and features and functions that may be requirements of the grants or uh, things that are eligible for reimbursement. So definitely encourage you to take a peek at the Gilbarco Leader Root website. Again, what I did is I went on the products and then I went down to incentives, and that's where I was able to, to get to this map. And then you can explore by state to see what dollars are available. Yeah, perfect. Good I was just to say, Alan, that um, I have heard from a lot of our customers that they are definitely interested in looking at the EPA grants um, that's funding that's coming out. But, you know, like you said, it comes out, and when that money is set aside and it runs out, you have to wait until they reissue new allocation to that fund. So, you know, time is to kind of start thinking about it now if it's something that you're interested in to see what funding is still left. That's right, absolutely, Heidi. And, and guys, it's important to note that the folks at Pathmaster have committed to being a partner with uh, Clean Fuels Ohio. So, you know, this is your the Ohio Clean Cities Coalition. Uh, this is a great organization with a lot of detailed information about dollars that may be available. And again, between the Barco Vita Route, Pathmaster, and, and that Clean Fuels Group, just have the finger on the pulse of what dollars may be available for different regions of the state or different regions uh, in the area. So definitely worth taking a peek at. Yep. Heidi, any other questions that have popped we up? We do, we have a, another one. So okay. um, Steve is asking, when do you expect electric vehicles to become mainstream? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, first thing that we might think about is the, the answer is somewhat of a moving target. So, you know, today everybody knows that EVs are more expensive. But we also know that there are federal grant dollars that help defray some of that cost. We know that the battery technology is getting better, um, which helps lower the cost of the EVs. So at some point here in probably the next three to five years, we should start to hit parity with traditional internal combustion vehicles. The other thing that I think is incredibly important to note is um, some of the regulations, the, the mandates that are coming from uh, the governor level in different states. Um, for example, California, the world's fifth largest economy, by 2035, you will not be able to buy an internal combustion vehicle in California. Guys, that's, that's less than 13 and a half years away. 
fifth largest economy. That's huge. Um, from the level of interest that we're seeing from others uh, in the space, uh, fleets, um, fleets are very concerned with their, their reputation and their carbon footprint. And a lot of times, if you're in a municipal environment, you may be one city council vote away from having to start an EV charging program. So when do the vehicles hit mainstream? It, again, a moving target depends on the type of vehicle that you're talking about. Can you buy an electric school bus today? Absolutely. Can you buy an electric uh, transit bus? Yes. All electric 18 wheeler? Sure, absolutely. So we're also seeing a big move from these OEMs. So you've got the, the state regulatory side of things, but you've also got the OEM side. So um, a lot of reasons why these OEMs like EVs because you know, it's new technology, it's less parts for them, but it also has to do with the global economy where China is choking itself in pollution. And uh, Chinese consumers are moving up in the economic scale. They want to drive vehicles, but China cannot stand to have any more pollution than they have today. Their skies are already where you cannot see the sun uh, because they're so much smaller. So China has been pushing their OEMs to make a move into the battery electric space. And I'll give you a good example. Uh, in 2018, the United States had 300 buses moving around the country. In 2018, China had 300,000. So, and from a global economy standpoint, this is absolutely the direction that things are headed. Um, so, ho hopefully, that answered the question. Hopefully, not too uh, too much uh, uh, magic eight ball for you. But uh, EVs are becoming more and more mainstream, and we're going to see more models and makes available on the market here as it continues to ramp up. So, uh, definitely an exciting time to be in the space. Yeah, and Alan, Maybe I hope that answered that one. I, I think so. If, it, if anybody else needs anything additional, please feel free to let us know. I will say I was out um, last week with the Ohio firefighters, um, and we met with several chiefs who are stating that the commander vehicles or the chief vehicles, they're starting to hear a lot about those changing over to electric vehicles. So it's not essentially the big uh, ladder trucks or anything at this point, but the smaller vehicles, they are definitely having conversations. And there was actually a presenter there who spoke all about electronic vehicles for fire usage. So while that's not you know, exactly for everybody, it is coming and you can see that it's trickling through not only the citizens, but municipalities, fire and safety. And it's just a matter of time till we really see a big influx of them. Um, there is another question too, Alan. Um, okay. So yes, I will definitely get you a copy of this presentation, um, Christopher. I will be happy to send that out after I clean it up a little bit and make sure there's no awkward moments from me starting the meeting, um, but I will get that out to you. And then Steve is asking if um, you've partnered with any of the large delivery services like Amazon, FedEx, UPS to power their distribution facilities. That's a good yeah, one. great question. So, you know, we, we do a lot of work with, uh, with those kinds of companies in our traditional fueling business. Uh, we also do a lot of work with really big OEMs. Uh, for example, if you were to go to, uh, to, to Volvo Trucks to their pr customer proving grounds in Dublin, Virginia, you'd actually see our chargers at that location. Uh, they've got a three-mile paved track that they bring all the big trucking companies to, to to drive the latest Volvo trucks and Mack trucks. Um, so again, you know, at that location, we've got our chargers. Uh, we are an incredibly well-respected name in the traditional fueling equipment space, and I can't speak enough to the volume of that history and what that means. Um, you know, being a 155-year-old company that's owned by a Fortune 500 group, we're not going anywhere. Uh, chances are, if you're in a municipal environment today, uh, if, if you're not in fleet, if you go chat with your fleet manager and ask if they're familiar with the Barco Vita route, they'll probably point to the wall and show you a piece of our equipment that's been on the wall for the past 17 years that they use every day for environmental compliance reporting. That long-standing history of, uh, of working with organizations and being there to su support their needs, I think that's going to translate very nicely into our e-mobility efforts. So I hope that answers the question about um, kind of who we work with and at what kind of scale. Okay. Are there any additional questions? 
I don't see anything, Alan, um, but by all means, if anybody has something that comes up after the presentation ends, you can reach me at Heidi.Jacko at PathmasterInc.com. Um, Alan is always willing to do a webinar or a Zoom or a Teams meeting, whatever um, it is, you know, if you need some additional information, we're happy to help. We know that some of us, you know, myself included, this was a brand new avenue, so there was a lot of questions, but definitely we're here to help you along your electronic vehicle journey. Um, and after that, thank you very much for attending. We definitely appreciate it. And thanks, Alan. Great job. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. All right. Thank you.